All right, what's going on everybody? In this video, we're gonna be doing some Algebra 2 final review. Now this is going to be the first of two videos doing some final review for Algebra 2 and in each video, I'm gonna have 25 practice problems and that'll be a total of 50 practice problems drawn from all different topics in Algebra 2. So. We got a lot to go over here, but before we get into the topics that we're going to be going over in this video, I wanted to quickly make sure that you're subscribed to this channel because I have a lot of different content on this channel, uh, ranging from math to physics, and you know definitely some stuff that you might need in the future. And I also talk about my you know college stuff as well, kind of what's going on in my life as far as that goes. So there's definitely a lot of cool stuff happening on this channel that you don't want to miss. Anyways, now that that's said. Let's get into this video. So in this video, as I mentioned, we're gonna have 25 practice problems, all right? And these are the following topics that these practice problems are going to be on. The first thing we'll talk about is linear functions and the inverse of functions. Okay, and with linear functions, we'll do a couple different things. We'll you know talk about some piecewise linear functions. We'll get into solving a system of linear equations. You know, We'll do a bunch of different stuff there. We'll then dive into exponential functions and equations, and then to logarithmic functions and equations, and then we'll do sequences and series, after which we will do quadratic functions, and then transforming functions and radicals, okay? And I have all of the timestamps on the left here, so if you're struggling with a certain topic in Algebra 2, you can jump right to that topic. Now, for me, it would definitely be exponential functions and equations. I think at first, when I was learning that, I definitely struggled a lot with that. So if it was me, I would jump right to the orange section. But anyways, now that that's said, there's a couple of quick tips that I wanna go through uh, before we actually get into our first problem, and that's try the problems on your own first. You, you definitely want to be trying these problems on your own because you're gonna have to do the problems on your own on, your t on the test, right? So doing the problems on your own is gonna be the best way to, you know, the best indicator to see, okay, how am I actually gonna do on the test? Right, so I think that that's a really wise thing to do. And of course, I'm gonna be going through all these problems. So after you try it, you can see my explanation for it. Okay, and see if you got it right, of course. Okay, the other tip is to take breaks. Okay, now you're not going to be able to get through this whole video, or at least you're not going to like getting through this whole video uh, without taking a break. It's gonna be a certain point at which you kind of start to burn out a little bit, right? So that's why taking breaks in, in, in between, and I'll give you reminders when to take breaks, you know, when we finish each section, it'll make studying a lot more effective. It's actually how I do all my homework. So uh, yeah, just a quick couple quick tips. Now that, that said, let's get into our first problem on the linear functions and inverses section. That first problem is, to find the inverse of the function f of x equals one over two x minus five. Okay, so we have to find the inverse here, but you know, we, we kind of get the idea of how to find the inverse of a function, right? Remember that when we have like, you know, y equals one over two x minus five, we find the inverse by switching the variables. So we write this as x equals one over two y minus five, and then you solve for y. And when you solve for y, you get your answer. But I want you to really understand what's going on here because this is, I mean, I understood the process when I was in algebra two, right? I understood how to get the inverse of a function, but I didn't understand why we were doing, what, what was so significant about inverses. And so real quick, I wanna talk about that. An inverse is useful, and I'll write this down, maybe you'd like to as well. An inverse is useful because it can be used to get back your original input. In other words, you know, I'll kind of put this simply, it reverses your function, okay? And what we're going to see when I, when we go through and solve this is that when you apply the inverse with the input of this inverse being the original function, right? 
the original function of x, you will get back when you apply the inverse to it, you will get back x. Okay, so whatever this f of x, whatever this function of x did to x, right? Whether it, you know, whether it was something like x squared plus 2x or, you know, whatever, when you plug in some x, right, into this function, and then you use that as the input for your inverse, it gives you back your original input. So if this was f prime or f to the f inverse of f of 2, you would get back 2. And so I don't confuse you anymore. Uh, let's actually go through this and then I'll show you how that actually works. So y equals 1 over 2x minus 5, right? That's the equation that we got. We obtain the inverse by switching the variables, right? As I said, so we're going to get x equals 1 over 2y minus 5. Okay, that's just switching the y's and the x's. Now, we have to solve for y. Okay, and well, how do we do that? Well, we can multiply by 2y minus 5 on each side. Okay, and that gets our y up in a numerator position, which is good. Okay, so we have x times 2y minus 5 equals 1, right? Because this will just be 1. Right, so now it's kind of clear to see that we just want to divide by x here, right, on both sides. And then we get 2y minus 5 equals 1 over x. We add 5 on both sides. And we get 2y equals 1 over x plus 5. The last thing to do here, divide by 2. And when we do that, we get that y okay, is equal to 1 over 2x plus 5 over 2. Okay? Just, you know, putting that, dividing this piece by 2 and dividing this piece by 2. Okay, I just kind of did that quick and mentally. All right, and that's how you get those pieces. Okay? So, great. We have our inverse function, right? We can label this as f to the negative 1 of x right, or f inverse of x, because it's not really to the negative one, it's just the notation for it. So what was I saying before about how to actually, like what would the inverse is good for? Well, now I'm about to show you. So we're, gonna sh we're just gonna plug in some random value in. Let's plug in one for this function, and you'll see that we actually get back one when we apply the inverse to the function, okay? Here we go. Okay, let's move all this over to the side. And let's just plug in one to our original function. Our original function is that y equals one over two x minus five. So we're gonna say f of one. Okay, we're gonna plug in one for the function. We get one over two times one minus five. And so we get a one over, this will be two minus five is negative three. So we get a negative one third, okay? That's f of 1. So now, what is f inverse when we plug in f of 1 as our input, right? Which is just saying, okay, we're going to plug this into here, okay? Because that is f of 1. f of 1 equals this, so that gets plugged in here, okay? So this is the same thing as f inverse of negative 1 third. So we plug in negative one third into our inverse function right here. And we get that this thing equals one over two times negative one third plus five over two. Okay, so this will end up equaling, oops, sorry, one over, it'll actually be negative three over two. Okay, because this three will end up going to the top all right, because on the, basically what you'll get here is a negative one over two thirds. And so just dividing two fractions at that point, right? You can think of it as um, you can do stay change flip, right? Or keep change change, however you remember dividing fractions, okay? Um, but anyways, you get negative three halves from this piece, and then we're going to add five halves and we get one. 
Why is that significant? Well, one was the original inputs of the function, right? We just said, I, I just said, hey, I'm gonna plug in one and we got some value. And what we did was we applied the inverse to that value that we got, the output, right? We applied the inverse function to it and we got back the original input, right? Which was one. So we applied the inverse function to negative one third and we got back one, our original input, okay? So that's the idea. Hopefully that makes sense. Now we're gonna move on to question two, okay? And that is to find the range of the piecewise function below. That piecewise function being g of x equals x plus four when x is in between negative two and two, including both endpoints, and x over two plus six when x is between two and four, not including both endpoints. Okay, so there's a couple different ways in which you could attempt to solve this problem. I think a lot of people would choose the long way, and myself probably included. And the long way is to graph this, right? And, and graphing, if, if you graph this, your goal is to just get a better idea of what you're looking at, right? You're trying to get an idea of what your piecewise function actually looks like, right? And for those of you that are uncomfortable with the idea of piecewise functions, okay, uh, a piecewise function literally just means, so this is going to be our function when we're in between this x interval, and this is going to be our function when we're in between this x interval, okay? That's the, the main idea of a piecewise function. You have different functions at different x values, okay? Hence the, the pieces, right? The piece in piecewise. Okay, but if you graph this, what you're going to see, and this is not what these uh, these functions actually are, but you'll, you'll get something like this, right? You'll get something like this. You'll have two open circle, or you'll have two closed circles because these things are closed, and you'll have something like this where you have two open circles. All right, because these things aren't including any endpoints, right? The idea, this is not, of course, this this is not this, okay? But I'm trying to give you an idea of what you would see, okay? The idea is that these two things are lines, okay? That's what I'm trying to get you to see. This th That's significant, right? They're lines, and what that means is that if we're trying to find the range, right, which is basically the opposite of domain, right? Domain talks about all the X values. Range talks about the set of all Y values, right? So a line is strictly increasing, decreasing, or it's not, it's doing neither, right? It's a slope of zero. We know that these two lines don't have a slope of zero, right? So, and then we can see that the coefficient on X is positive on both of them, right? So we know we're increasing on both of them, but that's kind of besides the point. If they're increasing or decreasing, that means that the maximum and minimum Y values on each line are going to be at the endpoints, right? It, we're looking for, for, to try to find the all the set of Y values, we're looking for the minimum and maximum Y values for each line, and then we're gonna compare them, okay? So, we're just going to focus on these endpoints here. Okay, and we're gonna put them together. And I'll go through this and then you know we'll we'll explain this a little bit more. So if you're having trouble, don't worry. The short way is to just recognize that these are lines. Right? If you recognize these are lines and you connect that, okay, well, since they're lines, that means that I only need to check the endpoints right? Because these are monotonic, which means they're strictly increasing or decreasing. Okay. So, so you only need to check the endpoints. Anyways, let's actually go do that. Let's plug in negative two and two for this X plus four function. If we plug in negative two. We get negative two plus four is going to be two. Okay. So great. Let's look at g of two. Okay, and we plug in two for that and we get six. 
All right. So we know the range for this first function is from two to six. And I'll write that in interval notation, right? And we use brackets because we're including both endpoints. Why are we including both endpoints? Because these are less than or equal to signs, right? The or equal to part means that they're brackets. Now let's look at the bottom function. We have G of two again, right? And we plug that in, we get two over two plus six. That's equal to one plus six, which is seven. And then we have G of four, four over two plus six is just two plus six and that's eight. Okay, so our range here, we, we already have it, right? Our range is two to six and from seven to eight. Notice that I put parentheses here instead, right? I put parentheses on these because there's no equal to signs here, okay? So we're not including either endpoint, and so we have parentheses, okay? And so that's our range, okay? Basically what we have is some graph that looks something like like I'll show you here. So it's from negative two to two, and then we have two to four. So what we have is something that looks like this. So it starts at two, okay? And it goes to six, actually mark that off, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay? It goes to six. That's what your first line looks like. And then you have from seven to eight. Okay, that's what your actual piecewise function looks like. Okay, and I can just tell that based off of the, the points on this line, right? Which we basically just found with all this stuff. Okay, so you can see here that's the range and you can see here that all we needed to find was the Y values at the endpoints. Right, because all of the y value, all of the y values in between are just not like they're not significant, right? They're just in between these two uh, points and these two points. Okay, so hopefully that all makes sense. Moving on to number three. This is probably our longest problem. We're solving the following system of linear equations, and this is a three by three. Right, we have three variables, three equations. So we need to start digging in here. Now, we have three equations, okay? And I'll label them one, two, and three because that's gonna make it easier to kind of just draw and organize the information, okay? So let's first off start by finding out a variable that we want to eliminate. Elimination method is going to be key here. That's generally how you solve uh, Anyway, any linear equations, any system of linear equations, it's bigger than uh, two variables. I mean, that's generally the method I see used most. I think that the best variable to eliminate here is gonna be Z's. And the reason why that is, is because if we just add one and two together, the Z's go away. Okay, and then we're going to have to do a little bit of manipulation to make the Z's go away for you know, w whatever pair of equations we wanna use next. Okay, so we gotta eliminate one variable. That's kind of the first step here, all right? And so how we're gonna do that is by putting equations one and two together. If we do that, we have four X minus two Y plus three Z equals two. And we have X plus five Y minus three Z equals negative two. All we got to do is add these equations together and we get 5x plus 3y equals this goes away and you just have 2 minus 2 which is 0. Okay so here is our equation without the z so I'm going to denote that equation 1 and 2. Okay now we got to do this again. Okay, we got to do this with two other equations and the equations I'll pick for that is two and three, just because there's already a minus sign here. So we can find some 
least common multiple between negative three or between three and four and then we can just add the equations together rather than if we had these things having to subtract the equations okay that's just a preference so let's do equations two and three okay well we get that well actually I'll just bring them down since uh, I can do that and stuff I'll bring them down okay and what we're gonna do is find a least common multiple here between three and four okay because we got to eliminate the z's so we got to figure out what we're gonna do to each equation to get them to a point where we can eliminate the z so if we're trying to find the least common multiple between 3 and 4, we know that that is 12, right? So we're going to have to multiply this equation by 4 on both sides. And we got to multiply this equation by 3 on both sides, okay? When we do that, we get 4x plus 20y minus 12z equals negative 8 and we get negative 6x plus 3y plus 12z equals 3. And then we add these together. Okay, we can do that now. All right, and the 12z's will go away. And that was the point of doing this. So now that they've gone away, we just have negative 2x plus 23y equals negative 5. All right? equals negative five. So this is going to be equation two and three. Okay, so that's important. Now, we have this and we have, so actually I'll highlight this so you know what I'm talking about. We have this and we have this. All you have to do now is put these equations together. Okay, and then we can eliminate another variable. Okay, it's basically like now we've reduced this three by three to a two by two, right? To two equations, two variables. And so now we can find out what one of those variables are and then just plug back in to one of these two equations that we just found and then plug back in again to one of the bigger equations to find what Z is. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so we'll, we'll take these two equations and I will bring them down here. You can see what I was talking about, about this equation being, or this, this problem being long. <laughs> Generally these, did I not copy that? Generally these problems can be pretty lengthy. Okay, so now that we have this, you can see that, well, it's gonna be kind of hard to eliminate the y's and so I'm going to look to eliminate the x's. How I'm going to do that? Well, we can see here that 10 is the least common multiple of 5 and 2. Okay, and so I'm going to multiply this side by 2 or this equation by 2 on each side and then I'll multiply this equation by 5 on both sides. And when I do that I get 10x plus 6y equals 0 and I have a negative 10x plus 23 times 5 is 115 and that gives me negative 25 by the way uh, I didn't do that in my head 23 times 5 uh, I just had that down on a piece of paper so don't get all intimidated or anything not that you would I, I probably would have though because that's the kind of weirdo I am anyways this gives you 121y equals negative 25 and so when you divide 121 on both sides you get that y equals negative 25 over 121 okay and there's your y now you just plug that back in to one of these two equations okay one of these two and you get your x value let's plug it into the nicer looking one which is 5x plus 3y equals 0 okay so this work is going to be a little bit sloppy, but that's because I silly, silly Lee. Uh, no, that's not a word. Let's find a word for that. Um, I stupidly, let's say stupidly. I didn't want to use that word, but 
I I should have made more space for myself. And I didn't. So we were plugging in Y here, and then we're just solving for X. 5X minus 75 over 121 equals zero. You can then just go about solving for X. So you add 75 over 121 on both sides. You get 5X equals 75 over 121. And then upon dividing five on both sides, you get that X is equal to and this would be a calculator problem if you haven't already guessed, but this would be 15 over 121. Okay, because 75 divided by 5 is 15. Okay, so there's your x. Now, let me delete all this stuff and we'll just find z. Again, sorry about cramping everything. Okay, so let's use equation three, because that's gonna be nice because we don't have to multiply, but we, we, we only have to multiply x by negative two and y by one. So it's just like the least amount of multiplication. Like we don't have to, we don't wanna have a five or a four in here, I guess. I mean, it, like I'm just trying to make things as easy as possible. So, but if you're using a calculator, I guess it doesn't matter. So now we have our x and our y, right? We see that x is 15 over 121 and y is negative 25 over 121. And we plug into, actually, let's not plug in yet to equation three. Let's rearrange the variables first, because then, you know, if we don't, re if we just plug in now, what's gonna happen is it's gonna be really messy. So we could just solve for z right now and it'll make our lives a little bit easier. So we'll add two X on both sides. We'll subtract Y on both sides. And I actually don't want to divide by four on both sides yet. So I don't want to get the Z completely by itself. And you'll see why. You can get Z by itself right now, but I, I just don't want to right now. And you'll see why. Okay, so two times x right two times this is going to be 30 over 121 and then minus y so that's going to be plus 25 over 121 okay and so you can change the one to be a 121 over 121 okay and then you can add them all together and you would get 176 over 121 and then you can divide by four on both sides Okay, this is why I kind of waited to divide by four because I think it would just look a little nicer. Um, but anyways, when you simplify whatever this thing is down, you get four over 11. Okay, so a lot of calculator work here, but I don't want to bore you with that, okay? So that's our, that's our longest problem, I think, of this uh, video. So it's all downhill from here, guys. And there's only one more problem in this section and then I'll remind you guys to take a little bit of a break, okay? Problem four is saying to write an equation for the line that is perpendicular to the line y equals negative one third x plus one and passes through the point three negative one. Write this equation in both slope intercept form and point slope form, okay? So there's two different forms for how you can write a line, okay? And they're actually kind of the same, and I'll show you why. So first off, we need to understand that to, to write an equation of a line, you need two things. That ran out of space. You need two things. You need first a point and second, you need a direction, right? You need a point on the line and you need the direction in which it's moving, right? And what do I, what do I mean by direction? Well, direction, you can think of it as slope, right? 
the slope because if we know the slope we know like okay it goes three up and then it goes one over then we know the direction in which the line is moving okay so that's the idea now there's two different equations that can do this right there is the probably the form of the equation that you're you, you're least used to seeing which is point slope form point slope form uh, states that we have a uh, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 okay so your point that you're plugging in is x1 y1 and your slope of course is m right so you have a point in the slope so this is a way to express a line there's also slope intercept form this is the one you're probably most used to seeing slope intercept form just states that y equals mx plus b okay and this is the exact same thing as this except the point that you have now plugged in is your intercept right this is instead of being slope sorry sorry instead of being point slope it's slope intercept because the intercept is the point right the intercept is like let's say it's one comma zero right or it would be sorry it would be zero comma one right because your x is zero at your y intercept okay well if you have a zero in for x what happens is let's let's just look at our point slope form you get a y minus let's so let's just keep calling one we'll call it y1 for now right because we know that our x1 is zero here okay so our slope we don't know okay and our x we don't know and our x1 we know is zero so simplifying this down we get that y minus y1 equals mx and if you add y1 on both sides you get that y equals mx plus y1 and y1 is b y equals mx plus b okay now i know that's a lot of you know variables that i'm throwing around there and, and all that stuff but just understand that when we plug in the intercept into this equation we get this equation okay that's the idea and we're actually going to be doing that in this problem so this is a useful bit of information I'm not just blowing steam at you okay so let's actually go ahead and do this now so let's I'm gonna delete this so we have our the most room possible so we want a line that is perpendicular to y equals negative one third x plus one now what does it mean for you know what, what does it mean to have a line that's perpendicular to another line like what is that what do we do well what we have to do to get a line that's perpendicular we just have to change the slope and the slope needs to be the slope of the new line needs to be a negative reciprocal I think that's how you spell reciprocal it could be wrong don't judge me <laughs> and what a negative reciprocal entails we, we know the slope is negative one-third here okay so it's literally just its name we first off we negate it and since it's already negative it becomes positive one-third and then we do the reciprocal which means we just flip the fraction and so we get three well, sorry that's a bad three three right three over one so three so the slope of the line that's going to be perpendicular to the line that we have here is going to be a slope of three and now we have the direction right we have the slope we have one of the ingredients that we need to define the line right the other ingredient that we need is a point and we're given that in the problem so now we have a point and we have a slope and we can now do point slope form okay so remember our point is three negative one i'm going to bring that down here and so doing point slope form we get that y 
plus one. Okay, it's plus one because it's remember y minus y one, and our y one is negative one, so it's a y minus minus one, so that becomes y plus one. Okay, so it's a lot of steps all at once. Y plus one equals m, which we know to be three, and that's going to be times x minus three, right? Because it's x minus x one. Okay. And so now that we have that, that's our equation. That's our equation in point slope form. But now we need our equation in slope intercept form too. So how do we do that? Well, actually we can just keep working this equation through and solve for y and you're actually going to see that slope intercept form pops right out. Let's do that. If we solve for y completely here, we get y equals three times x minus three minus one. Right, we just subtract one on both sides. And when we distribute this three, and we get y equals three x minus nine minus one, we literally just get the equation of the line in slope intercept form, which is y equals three x minus 10. Bam. Okay, that's literally it. You know, it's it's not very difficult to go from point slope form to slope intercept form. All right, it's actually, it, it's, it's pretty simple. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, that was our longest section. Okay, we had four problems. We don't have four problems in any of the other sections. It's, I believe, three in all the rest of the sections. So I do recommend taking a, you know, five minute break quick, okay? Take a five minute break, come back to the video and then we will go through and do the orange section on exponential functions and equations. Assuming that you've done that, let's get in to our next problem. Problem five is saying that we have an exponential function f of x and it contains the points 412 and 648. Now we're being asked to find the equation of this exponential function. Okay, so find the equation and then find the value of f of five. Okay, so what is the what what is an exponential function? I think that's a great place to start. Well, an exponential function is modeled by the equation y equals a times b to the x. Okay? So great, we know that. What do we do with these points? And you know like yeah, like I mean it, yeah, basically what do we do? Right? So all we have to get to find our exponential function here, right? To find our equation, we have to figure out what a is and we have to figure out what b is. Okay, if we can do that, we have our function. So, what are we, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to plug in our points. Okay, and make two of these functions. Okay, and then we're gonna compare them. So, first off, let's do our first point. Okay, and let's plug that in. We know that we have 12 being y and 4 being x. So this is going to be 12 equals a times b to the x, which is 4. And we can do the same exact thing for the second point. 48 equals a times b to the sixth power. So now your job is going to be to look at these two equations and figure out how you can single out one of these variables and find out what it is. Okay, it's basically just like systems of linear equations, right? We have to eliminate one of these variables somehow. How are we going to do that here? Well, adding these two equations together isn't going to do anything or subtracting them. What we're actually gonna have to do here is divide and you'll see that when we divide these two equations, we get A by itself or we get B by itself because we cancel out A. So what I'm gonna do is move this equation over and bring this equation down because I want to divide this way. Okay? And when I divide this way, what happens is we get a 48 divided by 12 on this side. Okay? And that is just going to give us 4. Alright? And we get that 4 equals the a's cancel and we have b squared. And so we square root both sides and we get the b is equal to two. Okay, and there's no 
plus or minus here because with exponential functions, we don't deal with negatives uh, for our b usually, okay? So we know where b is two and that's great. So now how do we find a? Well, we can just use one of these equations, either this one or this one, it doesn't matter. Let's use the one with the smaller number, 12, right? And the smaller exponent, four. And we'll just plug in 12 equals a, what we're trying to find, times b, 2 to the fourth power. Okay, well, 2 to the fourth power, what is that? Well, 2 to the first power is 2, 2 to the second power is 4, 2 to the third power is 8, and 2 to the fourth power is 16. Okay, so it's 16. And so we can divide by 16 on both sides, right, which is, you know, 2 to the fourth is 16. So we get that a is equal to 12 over 16 can be reduced to 3 over 4. And there you go, that's A. So that's great. We have what our B is and we have what our A is and so we can write our exponential function in this form, okay? And so it's Y equals A, 3 fourths, times B, 2 to the X, okay? And now, that's going to be one of our answers. And all that's left to do is plug in 5 for x and see what we get for a y value. Plugging in 5 for x. Well, what's 2 to the 5th power? 2 to the 5th power. We said 2 to the 4th power was 16. And so we need to multiply by 2 again and we get 32. So f of 5 is equal to 3 fourths times 32, okay? And you can reduce this by, say, by looking at, okay, 32 divided by 4, we know that's 8, so this is just going to reduce to 3 eighths, or not 3 eighths, sorry. Um, it will be 3 times 8, right? Because this will be an 8 and this will be a 1. Okay, so it's three times eight, and that's 24. All right, so that's it, right? We just plugged in the points after we, you know, remember what the actual equation was. We plugged in the points, we, we looked at the different equations, how do we combine them to eliminate one of the variables. We figured out that that was going to be by dividing. Once we divided them, we just, solved for one of our variables, we found the other, okay, and once we found the other, we have our function, and we used our function to find f of 5. Moving on to problem 6, okay, we want to state the y-intercept of the following function, and tell if the function represents exponential growth and exponential decay. Okay, so how do we find the y-intercept of the following function? For somebody that really doesn't know much about exponential functions, well, if you are just trying to find the y-intercept, you have to realize that the y-intercept is where x is zero, right? Because you're crossing the y-axis. Okay, let me just draw a picture quick. This is your x-y-axis. Your intercept line, right, is going to be anywhere here, right? That's where, that's any point where your y-intercept could be, where it intercepts the y-axis. And on the y-axis, these points will all have x being zero, right? Okay, so that's the idea here. Okay, and now that we have that under our belts, we can just plug in zero for x and find out what our y is, and that gives us our y-intercept. What you'll realize is that when we plug in zero for x, g of zero, we get one-fourth to the zero, and anything to the zero power is one, and so this is just equal to five, okay? So the, the funny thing is is that a here, right, this, this a, this represents your y-intercept, okay? And that's something you'll actually figure out by doing this, so it's kind of cool. The next thing that we have to figure out is whether this is exponential growth or exponential decay. 
okay? And I want to be honest with you, looking at this problem at first, I wasn't sure how I was going to figure this out. And then I just thought about it for a little bit. And I was like, well, let's think about what's happening with this function here. For this example, we're multiplying one fourth over and over and over again, right? Depending on how big this X is. And so if you're taking your original value of five, right? And you're multiplying continuous one fourths to it, right? Well, then this thing is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Because five times one fourths, right? Five times one fourths is equal to five over four, which is much smaller than five. And then you multiply by one fourth again, you get five sixteenths. It's, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so this is not exponential growth. This is exponential decay. Okay. And the main idea here is that if your B is going to be greater than one, all right, then you know it's exponential growth. And if B is less than one, it's exponential decay. Okay. Moving on to our next problem here. Number seven, we want to solve for X where we have 16 to the X plus three equals 64 to the X minus two. Okay. Now these problems actually aren't too terrible, right? They look bad at first, but if you kind of take a step back and just realize what's going on here and you make the first connection, you're fine. Okay. Here's the big thing that you have to realize. You can rewrite 16 and 64 as, well, you can write 16 as four squared. And that gives, and then you have to the X plus three power and you have 64, which is four cubed. And that's the X minus two power. Okay. This is the idea of common bases. Okay. And you'll see why rewriting it like this and this is going to be so beneficial. Okay. And the only other thing that we have to do here to finish rewriting this is realize, well, we have an exponent to an exponent. So what does that mean? Well, it just means we multiply that. Okay. So we get four to the two times X plus three equals four times three to the X minus two. Okay. So this is it, but now you have to realize that, well, the exponents are equal here because we have common bases, right? It couldn't be any other way. You can't say that, you know, it, these things could be this, these things can't be different because let's say that one of these things is one. Well, the other can't be two because four to the first does not equal four to the second, right? That's not true. And so we understand here, the only time that these two things can be equal is if you have, you know, four squared equals four squared and the exponents are the same or four to the first equals four to the first. Again, the exponents are the same. So the exponents have to be the same. And so we set these things equal to each other. Two times X plus three equals three times X minus two. Okay. And so you distribute on both sides, two X plus six equals three X minus six. I'm going to add six to both sides and I'll subtract two X on both sides. And when we do that, you just get that X equals 12. Okay. Now I know when I went a little fast in the beginning here. Okay. And so I want to just make sure that you understand why we did what we did. The main thing that you have to realize here when you have a problem like this is that 16, uh, wow, I did not expect a circle there. Um, 16 and 64 are basically, you know, four to a power, right? They have that they can be re re rewritten as a, you, you can use the common basis method because they can be re re rewritten as uh, the same base to a different power. Okay. 
That's the idea, right? So the same base being four to a different power, okay? Four squared is 16, four cubed is 64. And when you have a setup like this with, with exponents, okay, and the X's are in the exponents, I can almost guarantee you that it's going to be common basis method. Okay, so you should look, like, look for that. You could have something like 25 to the X plus three equals 125 to the X minus two, okay? And you should be able to realize, okay, I have to rewrite this 25 as five squared, and that's gonna be to the X plus three power. And then I have 125, which we know to be five cubed, and that's the X minus two power. So that's the idea that I'm trying to get at with that problem. Okay. And so I actually have a, a reminder here to, to break. Okay. Um, I know I just kind of sent you guys off on a break um, with the, because the exponential functions section actually went pretty quickly. Uh, but if you want to take another quick, you know, like two minute break or something like that, uh, feel free. If you're, especially if you feel like you're starting to burn out, take a breather. All right. Cause I know that last problem is a little unintuitive uh, at times, but I tried to make it as intuitive as possible. All right. Assuming that you are now ready to go for the yellow section, let's dive in. All right. So the yellow section, logarithmic equations and functions, problem eight, we want to determine log of five plus log of four minus log of two. This problem is actually just using log properties. Okay. You should realize that if you have two logs being multi being added together, you can just rewrite this as log of five times four. Okay. And then you have minus log of two. And when you have two logs being subtracted, right? You have two logs being subtracted. You can just rewrite this thing as log of five times four over two. Okay. So that's just something you need to realize about logs. Okay. So when it's subtraction, you get division, right? And when it's addition, you get multiplication. Okay. So now we can simplify this five times four is 20 over two is 10. So we get log of 10. And now we need to figure out what log of 10 actually is. So log of 10 equals something, right? It equals some X. We need to figure out what that X is. Remember all logs have a base of 10, right? If they don't already have a base to find. And so we'd have to use circle trick here. I call this circle trick. Okay. If you haven't heard of this before, um, basically, we're going to take this 10, put it here, take this X, put it here. Okay. In a big circle. And then you're going to make your base bigger. Okay. And so you get 10 to the X power is equal to 10. Okay. And well, what X would make that true? Well, one, right? So X equals one. So that's our answer. Okay. This whole thing, this entire equation that we started out with log of five plus log of four minus log of two, it's actually just one. So it's kind of interesting. Okay. The next thing we're being asked to is determine log base four of 256. And this is an example of when log does not have a base of 10, right? Another base is being specified here. Okay. So we just need to figure out what log base four of 256 is. So we'll set it equal to X, right? It's some value. It's some X. Okay. So we make the four bigger. We use circle trick 256 goes here and X goes here. So we end up with four to the X power equals 256. Okay. You have to ask yourself, well, what four, what we're sorry, what X is going to make this true? And to be honest, I don't know off the top of my head. So I got to li list this stuff out. And I don't know why I keep sc scrolling accidentally, but let's list this out. Four to the first power is four. Four to the second power is 16. Four to the third power would be 16 times four, 64. And four to the fourth power would be 64 times four, which is actually going to be 256. So we know here that four to the fourth power is 256. And so X equals four. Okay, X equals four. And so we can write that log base four of 256 equals four. 
Okay. Perfect. Problem 10, the last problem for the yellow section. All right. We want to solve for x here. We have 1 half log base 3 of x equals 2 log base 3 of 2. Now the problem here is that, well, we have logs on both sides, and so we can't do that circle trick that I showed you before. right? We can't do this, this circle business because we have two logs instead of one. So what do we do? Well, you'll see here that our logs have actually the same base, and that's going to come in handy. Because what we can do is actually basically the same thing as the common bases method that I showed you before, right? So with the common bases method, right, we express this in terms of the same base, the same base being four. So here, we're actually going to express this as, and I'll show you here, it's going to be log base three of two things. And we're going to have to set these two things equal to each other, right? So hopefully you can kind of see that, but I'll show you. Now, when we have a something being multiplied by a log, we can actually bring that in and have that being multiplied as an x, or not multiplied. It can be brought in as an exponent for the argument of the log. Okay, the argument being whatever's in the parentheses here. So we have log base three of x to the one half. Okay, hopefully that's a log property that you remember. We can do the same thing for the two here. Bring that two over. We get log base three of two squared. Okay, so we can simplify this a little bit. Log base three of x to the one half equals log base three of four. And now we can realize that x to the one half equals four. And you might be like, whoa, 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 where? Okay, how'd you get that? Where? What kind of sorcery are you using right now? Um, it's actually the same exact thing as the common basis method, like I said. You know, this thing can't be equal to each other if it's log base three of two equal to log base three of four. No, that no, that's not true. Okay, the, those two things are not equal to each other. You can plug it in your calculator and see. Okay, if you have one of the newer, newer calculators, you can plug it in with the base. Um, but but still, that's the idea of what I'm trying to get at here. Okay, these two things have to be the same, like log base three of two equals log base three of two. It doesn't equal log base three of four or log base three of six, right? It equals log base three of itself, right? Log base three of two. And so our arguments have to equal each other, right? This is an argument, this is an argument. Okay, they're arguments of the log. And so you square both sides here to get x completely by itself, and you get x equals 16, and that is your answer. Okay, and now we are finished with our log section. Okay, if that was a, a big headache for you, you can take another break if you'd like but I think you should try to push through for the sequences section. Um, if you aren't already too uh, fried already. <laughs> All right, so problem 11. We need to find an explicit formula for the sequence nine, five, one, negative three. Okay, and so what we need to figure out, okay, what is an explicit formula? What are we talking about here? Okay, well, and also we need to talk about the different types of sequences, right? That's another thing we should talk about. And there's two main different sequences that you learn in Algebra 2, right? There's arithmetic sequences, right? And there is geometric sequences, okay? Those are two different sequences that you learn. Now, what is an explicit formula? Well, an explicit formula means that you can find any term in the sequence by knowing the first term. And if it's arithmetic, you know the common difference. And if it's geometric, you know the common ratio. Okay, so you only need to know the first term and the thing that's changing between terms. Okay, recursive is the other type of formula. And that means you need to know the term before to know the term that you're trying to find. Okay, 
So, and I'll show you all this. So don't worry if that's not coming back to you fully, it's no big deal. We're doing three of these problems, right? So you have a lot of practice here. All right, so we need an explicit formula. Now, something I should write down is the explicit formula for an arithmetic sequence and the explicit formula for a geometric. So an explicit formula for arithmetic is a sub n equals a sub one plus n minus one times d. Okay, where a sub one is your first term. Okay, and d is your common difference, right? It's what's differing in between terms. Okay, and you have your geometric sequence which has an explicit formula of a sub n equals a sub one times r to the n minus one. Okay, and so these are the two explicit formulas, right? So you can find any term, right? Any, you know, n can be anything. So the idea is that you can plug in n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, right? You can find any term in the sequence by just knowing your first term, knowing your common difference, or knowing your first term and your common ratio. Okay, and so here we need to figure out, okay, what is the type of sequence that we're dealing with here? Is it an arithmetic sequence or is it a geometric sequence? Here, you can probably see that this is an arithmetic sequence because you can subtract four between each term, right? 9 minus 4 is 5, 5 minus 4 is 1, 1 minus 4 is negative 3. And so our common difference is negative 4, right? So D equals negative 4. We can also note that our first term is 9. And so now we have all the material that we need to construct the explicit formula, okay? So, you know, all we needed to do was find D, find A1, and label this as arithmetic. Um, arithmetic, okay? And if this was geometric, then instead of D, this would be an R. Okay, we'll do an example with the geometric series, don't worry. So now, let's put this together. We get that A sub N equals A sub one, nine plus N minus one times D, which is negative four. And since it's a negative, I actually wanna put the D out front here, just because it, it'll, it'll look a little bit better. So I'll write it like this. Okay, but that is our answer. Moving on to problem 12. We are given the recursive sequence below where a sub zero equals one and a sub one equals negative one. We wanna find a sub five, okay? Now, this is a kind of strange sort of sequence. This is not one of the sequences that, that you know, or it might not even have a name, right? Th this type of sequence. But the idea is that it has a, a really ta a challenging recursive formula. So to know, let's say we wanted to find a sub three. In this case, we don't just need to know a sub two. We don't just need to know the term before. We need to know the term before and the term before the term before. <laughs> so we need to know to find out a sub three, we need a sub two and a sub one, right? Not just a sub two, okay? So that's why we're given two starting terms. All right, so we know that a sub zero is one. We know that a sub one is negative one. And since this is the, a recursive sequence, we need to find what a sub two is and then find what a sub three is and then find what a sub four is. And then finally we get up to what a sub five is. Okay, a sub two is going to be, well, we're just plugging in a, this, this is when n equals two, right? Because if n equals two, then you get a two here. So a sub two, we get a sub two minus one plus three times a sub two minus two. So you just plug in a two wherever you see an n and you get a sub one plus three times a sub zero. Okay, what's a sub one? It's negative one. And what's a sub zero? It's one. And so you get negative one plus three, that is two. Okay, great. Now let's plug in three for n. 
When we do that, we get a sub 3 equals a sub 3 minus 1 plus 3 times a sub 3 minus 2. And so we get a sub 2 plus 3 times a sub 1. And we get 2 plus 3 times negative 1. And that is going to be a negative 1. All right. And now we need to find a sub 4. You kind of get the gist here. We'll get an a sub 3 plus 3 times a sub 2. And that is negative 1 plus 3 times 2, which will give us 5. And then a sub 5 is a sub 4 plus 3 times a sub 3. And that is going to be a sub 4 is 5 plus 3 times a sub 3 is negative 1. And so we get back to 2. <laughs> All right. And so that is your a sub 5. OK. So recursive formulas can be a little bit challenging. OK, I know a lot of people get caught up with, OK, you know, what am I like? How do I plug in for n and different things like that? They don't think about it the same as like a regular function. OK, they don't think about it as plugging something in for a value, right? To, to work with these sequences, it's just like a function. It's kind of like a different way of representing a function, okay? Instead of having f of x, you have a sub n, right? Where your input is n, not x, okay? If, if that makes sense. <laughs> so now we're gonna move on to problem number, uh, the unlucky number 13. Okay, problem 13 says, find a recursive formula for the sequence 9, negative 3, 1, negative 1 third, and goes on. So what kind of a sequence is this? Well, let's find out. What's the relationship between 9 and negative 3? Well, we could say, okay, well, you're subtracting 12. Well, if you subtract 12 from negative 3, you should expect a negative 15, but we have a 1 here. So we know it's not that. Okay, well, let's try to get from nine to negative three by multiplying. We would have to multiply by negative one third, and then we would have to multiply by negative one third to get from negative three to one. So that actually works. And this negative one third is our common ratio because this is a geometric sequence. Okay, so R equals negative one third. All right, so this is a geometric sequence. And now I think is a good time to state the different recursive formulas for arithmetic and geometric. And I'm actually going to use the template that I already set up here. And I'll just uh, change the equations. Okay, for a arithmetic sequence, the recursive formula is a sub n equals a sub n minus one plus d. That makes sense, right? It's the term before plus your common difference, right? So, so that should make intuitive sense, right? So it, you might have sequence five, 10, 15, your common difference is five. And so to get to 10, you need to have the term before five plus the common difference five, right? So you get to 10, five plus five is 10. That's recursive for arithmetic, recursive for geometric. Also should make sense. You're just multiplying your previous term by the common ratio. And to find the recursive formula here, all we have to do is plug in R, okay? That's really it. So we get a sub n equals a negative one third times a sub n minus one, right? And we, we know that the first term here is nine. Okay, so that's good to point out. So you could say something like where a sub one is nine. All right, I mean, that, that's, that's, I think that's good practice to have something like that uh, because then you know where you're starting from. But, you know, maybe you wanna talk to your teacher about whether you should include something like that. Okay, it may range from class to class. Okay, I can't speak for everybody, All right? But really the first, the, the only two things we had to, know here is whether 
this was a geometric sequence or arithmetic sequence, and then we found the common ratio because it was a geometric sequence, okay? And we, of course, had to know our formulas too, our different formulas. We knew that, and we were able to solve the problem. All right, and actually, yeah, I have, an, I have a note here for a break. So if, you know, I, we've done two sections at this point, um, and so I think a good five minute break is in order. All right, and then we will move on to our series section. And then after series, we have, what do we have? Quadratic functions, okay? So get through series here, and then we'll have a, a much easier section afterwards with quadratic functions. Okay, so that's all after you take your break. Assuming that you've done that and you're ready for the series section, let's get into this. <laughs> All right, for series, problem 14 is saying evaluate uh, the sum from n equals 1 to 3 of 2n plus 1 and the sum from n equals 1 to 99 of 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. All right, so let's just focus on one of these at a time. Let's not get too caught away, uh, caught up with the whole what the heck is this thing. Uh, let's just focus on this sequence series to start off with. Okay. Um, another thing that you might be worried about is what's the difference between a sequence and a series? It's a great question. Uh, for a sequence, an example of a sequence is like one, two, three, four, right? It's a comma separated list. For series, instead of having a comma separated list, your terms just get added together. Okay. So that's the idea of the series. It's the difference. So we're trying to find, the, you know, the idea here is that we want to find the sum of a series. So we want to find, okay, well, what is this sum? All right, and that's what these big sigmas, the, we used to call this the big E back in <laughs> uh, algebra two or pre-calculus, whenever I learned this. Um, but yeah, that, that was the idea. We're trying to find the sum, right? That's what this means, the sum. So what we need to do is, plug in 1 through 3 for 2n plus 1. So we're going to start off by plugging in 1. We get 2 times 1 plus 1. Okay, and this whole piece is n equals 1. Then we add the n equals 2 piece. 2 times 2 plus 1. Right, and this whole piece is n equals 2. Then we add in the n equals 3 piece. Right, because this goes from 1 to 3. And so 2 times 3 plus 1. That's the n equals 3 piece. All right. And so this is 2 plus 1, which is 3, plus 4 plus 1, which is 5. And then 2 times 3 is 6, plus 1 is 7. So this is 15. So that's our first answer. All right, so that's our first answer. Now we gotta figure out what the heck is going on with this series here. We can't use the same exact strategy because that's going to take forever. You're gonna realize that we don't have to after writing a full, uh, a few, a first, the first few terms here, okay? So let's do this. For this sum here, and I'll bring it down just so we have it to look at. Let's just start writing off terms here. Right, let's do the n equals 1 term. Because it starts from 1, it goes to 99. We'll do that, plug in 1 for n. Okay, and we get this. Okay, and 1 plus 1 is 2. We can actually just simplify that now. It's a good thing to do that. Okay, and okay, that's great. This is our n equals 1 term. Let's do our n equals 2 term. We get 2 for n, so 1 over 2 minus. 1 over 3. That's n equals 2. Then we do n equals 3. 1 over 3 minus 1 over 4. Okay? And then we go, you know, all the way out. We keep going, keep going. And then we get to 98 and 99. So 99 is 1 over 99 minus 1 over 100. And that's your last term. And the question is here, do I have to do all the terms in the middle? And you should see here that no, you don't. Here's why. Okay, and whenever you see a sum that's this huge, that's what I would, uh, you know, tell you is that, hey, you should probably um, do, 
like look for this type of sum. This is called a telescoping sum. Why? Because it kind of folds up like a pirate's telescope. Okay? Because here's what happens. This negative one half cancels out with this one half. Negative one third cancels out with this one third. And this trend will keep continuing on and on and on. Okay? And so the question is, well, what gets canceled here in your last term, right? Everything is going to get canceled in between. All right, but what gets canceled in your last term? Well, we know that the first term is getting canceled by the term that comes before it, right? So like this one half got canceled out by the one, negative one half that was in the term before. So we know that when we, we do have a term before, we have an n equals 98. And so that's where that will get the one over 99 canceled off. But the second term, the negative one third, will get canceled off by something that happens in the next term. Okay? And well, we don't have an n equals 100 term. So the negative 100 is gonna stay here. And really, all of this, this huge mess, right, from one to 99 just simplifies down to one over one, which is just one minus one over a hundred, right? And literally that is just 99 over a hundred. And that's your answer. Okay. That is called again, a telescoping sum. Okay. It compacts like a pirate's telescope. Okay. Anyways, let's move on to problem 15, which uh, says to find the sum of an arithmetic series whose first two terms are negative 12 and uh, negative uh, eight and whose last term is a hundred. Okay. So how do we find the sum of this arithmetic series? Well, what you have to realize is that well, what's the what's the formula? There's a formula to find the sum of series. Okay. There's a formula to find the sum of an arithmetic series, and there's a formula to find the sum of a geometric series. Okay. This right here, what I have wrote right here is the formula to find the sum of an arithmetic series. This is the formula that we need to use. Okay. So we have S sub N, which I will explain what that means. S means the sum, the sum of n many terms. So if we plugged in an eight here, it's the sum of the first eight terms of the, ser of the series. If you plugged in a seven here, it's the sum of the first seven terms of the series. Okay, but we want all of the terms in the series, right? So we need to figure out how many terms are in the series. All right, we need to figure out how many terms are in the series. And well, we know the last term is a hundred. That, that's a sub n, right? That's our last term. Okay, and we know that our first term is negative 12. That goes in for a sub one, right? That's our first term. And so really all that's left to find is how many terms are in the series. How do we find that? Well, what we can do is look at the relationship between the first and, two, and the second term, right? This is an arithmetic series, so we know that there's a common difference. We can see that that common difference is four, right? Negative 12 plus four is negative eight. Okay, and so if d equals four, we can find out how many terms are in the series. So we can write, you know, we can do the explicit formula. a sub n equals a sub one plus n minus one times d, right? And a sub n is 100. a sub one is negative 12. And n, we don't know. We don't, we want to know you know, a sub n, what is the nth term? The nth term we're trying to refer to is the last term here. Okay. So, so what n would we be plugging in here? And that's what we're trying to find. The D is four. So I will write this, we'll rewrite this as 100 equals negative 12 plus four n minus four. We'll combine like terms here. A hundred equals four uh, n minus 16. We'll add 16 on both sides. 4n equals 116. All right. And we'll divide by 4 on both sides to get 
that n is 29. So there's 29 terms in this series. All right, so there's 29 terms in the series. Cool, now we can plug in everything, okay? We're trying to find the sum of 29 terms because there's 29 terms in the series. That's gonna be 29 divided by two times a sub one, negative 12, plus a sub 12, or sorry, a sub 29, right? Because that's n here, 29, and that's 100, okay? So s sub 29, equals 29 over two times whatever negative 12 plus 100, that's 88. And so you get a final answer of, you put that in your calculator, you get 1276. Okay, so before we actually end this problem, I want to make sure that you understand why this formula makes sense. Okay, this formula makes sense because Really, this is just averaging, right? We're, we have two terms here, and we divide by the number of terms we've just added together, okay? Now, why would we wanna average things here? Well, it's kind of like, okay, let's say we have a series, two plus four plus six plus eight plus 10, okay? We can literally find the sum of this series by just, we have our first term, we have our last term, and we know how many terms are in the series. So we know the, like the steps that are being taken. All right, so, you know, it, it's like, it, it's like, that's the, the idea behind why this formula makes sense, okay? Because all we need to know is the first term, the last term, and we need to know the information about what terms are going to be in the middle here. And that's given by how many terms are in this series. All right. So that's the idea. Now on to problem 16, which I believe is the last problem in, yeah, it's the last problem in this section. Okay. In the aqua section. So find the sum of a geometric series with eight terms a common ratio of two, and a starting term of four. All right, so for this problem, we know that there's eight terms, so we'll write n equals eight. We know there's a common ratio of two, r equals two. And we know that a sub one is four because there's a starting term of four, okay? So now we can just find the sum of this geometric series, okay? And to do that, we need to plug in to our formula that we know for a geometric series, right? We know that for a geometric series, S sub N equals A sub one plus A one minus R to the N over one minus R. Okay, and so we can just plug in here. And sorry, this is not plus, this is times. There we go. All right, so plugging in here, we have a sub one is four. We have a one minus R to the N over one minus R. And so we get that uh, we have four times one minus two to the eighth is 256. And so it's gonna be one minus 256. We get over one minus two. And so this is equal to four times negative 255 over negative one. And that is equal to 1020. Okay, and that's a sub eight. I forgot to plug in the eight for N. Okay, so it's just, it's plugging into the formula that you should know for, uh, for geometric series, which is this formula right here. Okay, so that's it. Now let's move on to our third to last section on quadratic functions. 
which is asking us to find the vertex of the following quadratic and state whether it is a maximum or a minimum. Okay, so how do we find the, the vertex of a quadratic? What do we do? What's the method? Well, the method that we need to use is completing the square. Okay, if we complete the square, we put a quadratic into vertex form. Okay, hence we can find the vertex. And then we'll be able to tell, we can actually tell right now whether the vertex is going to be a maximum or minimum. And by that I mean, look at the coefficient on x squared. Okay, if it's positive, then it, you know um, that your parabola is upward facing, or upward opening rather. So it's going to look like this, or this, or this, but it's going to always open upward. If your coefficient on x squared is negative, like y equals negative x squared, your parabola is going to open downward. And so if your parabola opens downward, you know that your vertex is going to be the maximum, right? The maximum y value. If it is positive, you know you have a minimum, right? So that is the idea. All right, so we know we're going to have a minimum, so we can underline that for now. So now we got to put this quadratic into vertex form. All right, how do we do that? We have to start off by completing the square. We have to put this into uh, x minus, this is b over 2 squared. That's what this gets put into. Okay, so b over 2, right? Remember, ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, that's where I'm getting the b from. B is uh, going to be negative 4. You divide that by 2 and you get a 2. Okay? And sorry, this is actually x plus b over 2 squared. The reason why I was saying negative is because we already have a negative here. So, sorry, that's a little bit confusing. But you put it down into this form, right? And so we have a plus 2 here. Now the problem that we have with completing the square is that this piece is not equal to this piece. Why? Because if we expand x minus 2 squared, we get x squared uh, minus 2x minus 2x, so it would be minus 4x, plus 4. We have an extra plus 4 here and we don't have that here. So what we have to do to correct that is subtract 4. If we're subtracting 4, then that means that this thing goes away. And so we just are left with this, um, or well, sorry, we're left with this. So we have the same thing over again. So we can say that this is f of x equals x minus two quantity squared minus two. And so now we have this thing in vertex form. And so we can find our vertex, which is h comma k Remember, you have to switch the sign of the inside, so the inside does, the, the h is not uh, minus 2, okay? Uh, remember, vertex form is a times x minus h squared plus k. You might use different variables, that's fine. The key point is that this is a minus inside. So, the idea is that you have to flip the sign of the inside here. So, h is 2 and k is negative 2. And so your vertex is 2, negative 2, and that is going to be a minimum, and we already discussed why. What is going on here? Go away. Um, okay, great. All right, so that is it for problem 17. On to problem 18. We want to solve the following quadratic inequality. Okay, these are interesting. So I actually have the steps for how to solve a quadratic inequality just written sloppily on the, the right here. So I apologize, for, that's kind of like a little sloppy. Um, but basically what I'm saying is the first step is to turn the, quadra the, the quadratic inequality into a quadratic equation. Okay, so that meaning we're just gonna change the greater than or equal to sign to an equal sign. Okay, And what we're going to do next is just find the solution. So we're going to solve it as normal. Okay, So we need two numbers that add to be 2 and multiply to be negative 8. Those two numbers are going to be 
4 and negative 2. 4 minus 2 is 2. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. x plus 4, x minus 2 equals 0. And so we see that x equals negative 4 and x equals 2. All right, and this should be something you're fairly quick at now, so hopefully I didn't go too fast there. If I did, you know, feel free to pause the video quick and, you know, catch up or rewind it. That's fine. <laughs> whatever whatever you need to do. Um, but anyways, uh, the third step is to make a number line and check each solution and interval. Okay, and this is where the greater than or equal to sign actually comes in, right? That's where it comes into play because we have a number line here now, right? And we have two here, we'll have negative four on the other side of that. And we need to see, okay, where is this quadratic being shaded? Like, is it, is it going to be like up here? Is it going to be down here? Like, where's the, wh which, which part is, is all part of the solution? Like what, what X's will make this greater than or equal to zero? That's the solution set that we're finding right now. Okay, so let's do that. We, all we have to do is find three test points. The test points that I'm gonna use is going to be, we're gonna use, let's use negative five for the first one, I guess. We'll use negative five. We will use zero and we're gonna use three. Okay, those are gonna be our test points, so I'll, Write it down like that. Negative five will give us, and when we plug that into this first equation right here, we get negative five squared plus two times negative five plus, not plus, minus eight is greater than or equal to zero. We gotta see if this is true. Well, we get a 25 plus, it would be actually minus, minus 10, minus eight is greater than or equal to zero. This is gonna be minus 18. So we basically get seven is greater than or equal to zero. And that's true. So we can shade this way. All right, let's see if zero works. And also, by the way, we know that there's going to be uh, dots here and they're not going to be open dots and the reason why is because we have a greater than or equal to All right, so we know that uh, negative 4 and 2 will make this thing 0 because we just found that out right here So they're included All right, awesome. So Next we need to plug in 0. That's the other test point that I wanted to put Okay, that's in between negative 4 and 2 when we do that we get a 0 squared plus two times zero minus eight. And we'll see if that's greater than or equal to zero. It's not because we have this. And so that doesn't work. Lastly, we have three, which is the other one I wanted to include because that's in this area. All right. And when we do that, we get three squared plus two times negative, not negative, uh, two times three minus eight is greater than or equal to zero. We can see here that this is just nine plus six minus eight. And that is seven again. And that's greater than or equal to zero. So we know that that's good. And so we can get our shading going. All right. And so we have our number line now. All right. And we can actually write the solution in interval notation if you want, or this is fine. But we'll write the solution in interval notation just so you are really comfortable with that notation. The number line that we just drew here is denoting that the solution is from negative infinity to f negative four, which includes that endpoint. And we have two including that to infinity, not including infinity, of course. So that's another way of writing your answer. If it asks for that, so specifically, I guess. Okay, so that's step three. Make a number line, check each solution on the interval. Okay, 
Now we can move on to number 19, okay? Which is actually the last problem in this section. Now we only have two sections left, okay? So find the zeros of h of x equals 4x squared minus 4x minus 3. Now how do we wanna do something like this? There's a couple different ways, right? You have your regular factoring, right? You've complete the square. And lastly, you have quadratic formula. If you have something that looks nasty in any way, like it has anything other than a, a one in front of the x squared, I would go with the quadratic formula. Okay, and so we can do that. We need to define what a, b, and c are, right? We know that a is equal to four, b is equal to negative four, c is equal to negative three. And so we get x is equal to negative b, which is four, plus or minus the square root of, sorry, I'll write the actual quadratic equation down. I just remembered that I should probably do that. Uh, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, yeah, that, that's what we're doing right now. So b squared is gonna be 16 minus a four times a times c all over 2a, that'll be eight. So we get x is equal to four plus or minus the square root of 16. This will be plus 48 all over eight. Four plus or minus the square root of 64 over eight, which is four plus or minus eight over eight which is, you know, well, we can just solve it from here. Um, actually, we'll reduce this to, we'll divide a four everywhere, then we get one plus or minus two over two. And so we get that when we add the one and two together, we get x is equal to three halves. When we subtract them, x is equal to negative one half. Okay. And I did go a little bit faster there, but you've done with the quadratic formula for like a really long time. <laughs> all right, so uh, hopefully that all made pretty good sense to you, okay? So uh, now that is complete and we are actually at a, a break point right now. So um, if you wanna take a, you know another five minute break, feel free, come back to the video and we have two more sections left and then we're done with our first 25 problems, okay? Remember the two uh, sections that we have left are transforming functions and radicals and then we're done and I get to go to bed. <laughs> so yeah, assuming that you're ready, problem 20 is on transforming functions. We wanna state the transformations done to y equals the absolute value of x to obtain the function below. The function below being the g of x is equal to negative two times the absolute value of x plus one minus four. Okay, so how do we look at the transformations done to this thing? What, what are the different kinds of transformations that can be done? Well, the different kinds of transformations, we'll kind of just go with the flow here. We're gonna look at the order in PEMDAS. Okay, and we're just gonna see what's being done with X. Okay, first off, we can see that, you know, we'll kind of treat these absolute value signs as parentheses. All right, so that'll cover our P and E. And you see here that there's an, a one being added to X. Now, what does that mean? Well, if there's anything being added to X inside the parentheses, that's denoting a shift left or right. Okay, if there's anything being added or subtracted, it's shift left or right. Since it's being added, we switch that right we we make it a we make it a negative in our heads right and we think left okay so we know that one it's being shifted left by one unit okay and this x is positive so we're all good and it's by itself so we don't have to worry about any other like stretching effects or um any flipping about the y-axis or anything like that. Those are other transformations, which if you don't know what I was just saying at all, you probably want to look a little more into this section. Okay. Now, 
let's move on to multiplication and division. And that's the negative two out front, right? The negative two, there's two pieces here. First off, there's a two. The two is a vertical stretch, right? The number out front is either a vertical stretch or shrink. And since it's a number that is greater than one, it's a vertical stretch. And so that's number two. And we write that as a vertical stretch by a factor of two. Third, we have this negative. If you have a negative out here that is a uh, flipping, so it's a reflection over the x-axis. If you had a negative on the x in here, that's a flip over the y-axis. And fourth, we look at our addition and subtraction, and there's a four being subtracted here on the outside, not in the parentheses, and so that is a shift up or down. Since it's negative, it's a shift down. Okay, so we shift down four units. And that's your answer. All right, so it's all just you know following the order of PEMDAS and knowing what each component means, right? We know we have a shift left or right if it's inside the parentheses. The number outside being multiplied is either a stretch or a shrink in the vertical direction. If there's a negative out front, it's a flip over the x-axis. And if there's a number being added or subtracted on the outside of everything, it's a shift up or down. Problem 21 is asking us to find the equation of y equals x squared after it's been shifted left by two and down by five. Okay, so let's look at the the kind of the, all the notes that I have written right here, right? We have a shift left and we have shift down. And we have what those things correlate to right here, okay? A shift left means that we're going to add something in the did like 2x, right? And it's got to be inside the parentheses. So how are we going to do that? Well, that's just going to be y equals a x plus 2, right? It's plus 2, not minus 2, because we're shifting left, OK? And then we're also going down by 5, and so we're going to just subtract 5 on the outside. Okay, and that takes a little while to get used to. You might have to really review this section, especially the transforming section section. Um, the transforming functions section. Okay, that's what I meant to say. But yeah, because th this is this section can be definitely uh, really memorizey. So, you know, just a fair warning there. Uh, for problem 22, the last problem for this transforming su function section. This isn't really much of a transformation question, but I think it's a good question nonetheless. So find which of the functions below is even. We have four functions, y equals x squared minus three x, y equals the absolute value of x minus four, y equals five minus x squared, and y equals four to the x. And actually, I guess this is a really transforming functions question. The reason being, if you know what even is, then you just have to understand what the different manipulations that are being done on each of these functions are. A function is even if it has reflection about the x about the y axis. So even is reflection over y axis. An example of this is a parabola, the classic parabola y equals x squared. Right, so this has symmetry over the y-axis. It's poorly drawn, but you get the idea. Okay, so now we have to figure out, well, which of these functions is it? And it's not going to be A. Here's why, because there's a minus three X here. Okay, if there's a minus, or a, you know, in any term here with an X in it, okay, on a quadratic, that correlates to a horizontal shift. 
okay and so you're gonna have a shift left or a shift right and it's not or you know it might be up or down it, there's a lot of things that play into that um, and you can complete the square on this to figure all of that out uh, based on like the vertex but the idea is that if you have an x term on a quadratic it's not going to be even okay because there's a lot of different things that play into that all right and so we already can kind of tell that this is not going to be even so next is the absolute value sign and you see we have a minus four in the absolute values. What, what does that do? That shifts the absolute value of X, right? This is the absolute value of X right here. Sorry, I should write it in a different color. Here we go, absolute value of X. What it does to the absolute value of X is it just shifts it over to the right four. So it ends up being over here. And that wouldn't make it not even anymore. It does not have symmetry about the y-axis. So it's not going to be B. Now what about C? C just has negative x squared, right? So it's a downward facing parabola. And then you have five added to it, right? It's a positive five. So this thing is gonna look like this. And so that's even still, because there's no, there's no x term, right? There's no something like this. So it's still going to be an even function. It's not going to be shifted left or right. And so this is actually going to be our answer. And just to further prove that, the exponential function for the x, right? That's just gonna look something like this. And that is definitely not even at all. Okay, so that's just an easy way to check for even functions. All right, so if you wanna take a quick, like one or two minute break, that's fine. Uh, but we're hopping into our last section here. We have only three more problems left and that concludes our video. All right, so on this last section here, radicals uh, problem 23, solve the square root of x plus four equals x minus two and list any extraneous solutions, okay? Extraneous solutions, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Basically, they're solutions that aren't actually solutions. Okay, and so you, you probably remember that term, but you might not know exactly where to put it, and that's kind of how I felt when I was in Algebra 2. So, you know, if you feel that way, don't worry. Again, we're going to go over it. All right, so let's get solving this equation here. And the first question is, well, what are we going to do with this? And... I think a good thing to do would be to square both sides because it gets rid of that square root on this side. So we just get an x plus four on this side, right? And on the other side, we got a foil out. So we get x squared minus two x minus two x plus four, right? You can think of this x minus two quantity squared as a x minus two times x minus two. And so you get x plus four is equal to x squared minus 4x plus 4. Okay, and you can just subtract x and subtract 4 on both sides and get that 0 equals x squared minus 5x and this will actually go away so it's just plus 0. Alright, so now having that we can just solve for x here by factoring. We get zero equals, we can factor an x out. We get x minus five here. And so you can see here that x equals zero and x equals five, right? Because x equals zero, we'll make this whole thing zero. And if you have an x minus five, or sorry, an x equals five, you would get a five minus five here, which is zero. All right, so now, we have to see if one of these solutions are extraneous. So we have to see, does both of these things make it true? All right, and so let's first plug in zero to this original equation. Square root of zero plus four equals zero minus two. Well, that gives you square root of four is two, zero minus two is negative two, and that's not true. Two does not equal negative two, okay? So we know that zero is actually an extraneous solution. Something that is not an extraneous solution though is x equals five. Because when we plug this in, five plus four equals five minus two, we get three equals three. 
Okay, so that works. The question that you're probably wondering, okay, after I circle our answer here, the question that you're probably wondering is, how does an extraneous solution come about? Why is this something that we're dealing with now? And we never had to deal with anything like this in like algebra one, or we don't need to deal with it in most cases. Here's why. Mm -hmm. An extraneous solution can come about when you square both sides. The reason why is because think about if you were to try to, let's say that we have, um, x plus 4 equals x minus 2 quantity squared, right? It's, it's basically what this was, right? And we try to put it back into this form. So we square root both sides. Well, when you square root both sides and you get a square root of x plus 4 equals the, just equals x minus 2, right? The problem is that you had to do a plus or minus on one of the sides. Right, so this should actually be plus or minus square root of x plus four, which if you remember the extraneous solution that we got when we plugged in zero, we get two equals negative two. So both those solutions are correct for this equation, not for this equation. Okay, so it's kind of an artifact of squaring both sides. Okay, it kind of changes the equation just a little bit, but you can check the answers. Okay, and so this is still a good method to use squaring both sides. Okay, but you've got to realize that when you square both sides, you are kind of playing with fire a little bit, you might end up with an extraneous solution. Okay, so that's just the idea. That's what I wanted to, you to see. Okay, and now that we have that done, let's move on to problem 24, which is a little bit of work with exponents here. Right? Um, if g of x is 10 to the x minus one, uh, plus three x to the three halves, find g of two. So we're just plugging in g of two here. Plug in two for x. We plug in two for x, we get 10 times two to the negative one, plus three times two to the three halves. Okay, and so we just have to figure out what these different exponents are doing. We know that a negative exponent, two to the negative one, is just one over two to the first power, which is one half. So we get the g of two is equal to one half, sorry, 10 times one half plus three times, okay, what do we do with this thing? Two to the three halves. Well, remember that the exponent, if it's a, if it's a fraction, it's power over root. And so this is a two to the third power square rooted. Okay, so it's just basically three to the square root of two cubed. Okay, and we can simplify this to be five plus three rad eight. Okay, and we can actually simplify this, put this in simplest radical form. We can instead write this as, uh, we can break up the rad eight, okay, into rad four and rad two, right? Because four times two is eight. So rad four is two. And so this is five plus six rad two. Okay, red eight is equal to two red two. And so that is G of two. And that's your answer. Okay, the only thing to remember here, I mean, this is basic, except for you need to understand that when you have a fraction in the exponent, it's power over root. Okay, and when it's negative, you just have to do this, right? You have to flip the, um, entire value and then you can make the exponent positive again. All right, last problem. Find the zeros of f of x equals three x squared plus four x minus six and make sure your answers are in simplest form. We have a non one term in front of the x squared. So we probably wanna do quadratic formula here. Okay, let's do that. Remember that a equals three, b equals four, and c equals negative six. So plugging into the quadratic formula, x is equal to negative four, plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's 16, minus a three 
uh, sorry, minus a 4 AC, so 4 times 3 times negative 6. And it's all over 2A, which is 2 times 3. It's equal to negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 16 plus, right, this will be plus uh, 24 times 3, or which is 72. Go over 6. All right. And that gives us negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 88 over 6. Okay. Now remember, we need our answer in simplest form, right? So simplest radical form is part of that. We have to break up this square root of 88. How do we do that though? It's just the same thing as we did in the last problem. We have to break this up into something that like, like a square root of four. Can we take out a square root of four here? Well, yeah, we can because this is a multiple of four. This can be simplified to a square root of four, square root of 22. And this is two. So square root of 88 is equal to two rad 22. Because I don't, I don't think we can break down square root of 22 anymore. So we can write this as x equals negative four plus or minus two rad 22 over six, right? And we can divide two everywhere now that we have uh, multiples of two everywhere. And we get x equals negative two plus or minus rad 22 over three. And that is the answer to the last problem here. All right. So hopefully uh, this was a good review session for you. I'll tell you the topics for part two briefly. I know you, you know, after viewing this whole video, you probably don't want to think about part two yet, but here are the topics that we will be going over in that video. First is complex numbers. Second is polynomials. Then we'll talk about rational functions, long division, circles, trig expressions, trig functions, and we'll end it off with the thing I hate most, probability. All right, so a lot of topics that we'll be going over in the next video, so you definitely don't wanna miss that out. Make sure that you have a really good grasp on Algebra 2 and all the topics in it before your final, because if you do, you'll do a lot better, right? If you have a good grasp on everything. So um, I really hope this video helped, and uh, if it did, be sure to subscribe for, for more content and be sure to hit the like button and all that stuff. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. Um, and yeah, yeah, I hope this video helped and I'll see you in the next video.